All right, well, thank you for having me uh, again. Uh, you didn't have a choice, but um, I appreciate you not campaigning for me not to be here. Um, I, uh, I just want to be clear, because I, I wear two hats. So uh, I have a bio in the, in the program that talks a lot about Barna, and I do uh, oversee uh, Barna in uh, Europe and the UK. Um, but I also have my own PR business, and uh, we started, my wife and I started a PR business uh, nine years ago. Um, and uh, so I come to this conference with, with both hats. I've done one seminar yesterday with my Barna hat on, and today I have my uh, Jersey Road PR hat on. Um, what I want to do today is to give a little bit of uh, context to, uh, to what I see as some of the trends in uh, whether it's society. Um, uh, I want to talk a quite practically about how we engage with the media. Now, we actually have media in the room, so uh, they can tell me whether I'm speaking the truth or not in a post-truth world. Um, and, uh, and then <clears throat> I want to, uh, to just, just uh, finish up with some, some, some practical stuff that, that we can em em employ uh, as we want to tell the story of the church. The reason that we started a PR business, and uh, my wife is a journalist uh, by trade. Uh, she worked for Elle magazine and Men's Health magazine. Uh, I often tell people that's how we met. Um, <laughs> yeah, I often get that response uh, and it's not true. So, um, but uh, she, she has got a, she's got quite a strong media background. My background was actually in publishing. So I, I, I used to manage a company called Authentic Media. Uh, which was part of uh, STL, which is a, a large uh, Christian distributor. Um, but the STL went out of business. Uh, I was made redundant. Uh, my wife had handed her notice in to World Vision. Uh, and so both of us were sat on a Monday morning thinking, what next? And God planted this, what we didn't realize was a vision at that point in us, that he wanted to tell his, the story of his church. And... I, 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 <clears throat> I'm speaking, I will speak sometimes from a UK perspective, but I, I really hope that what I share today can be helpful um, across Europe and, and maybe beyond that as well. Um, the, the, the media, certainly the national media, have a very narrow and often negative portrayal of the church, that the church is either uh, involved in child abuse or involved in financial misappropriation. And we felt that there's so many good things happening in the church and through the church that we wanted to try and tell that story to a wider audience so that people can meet Jesus. And sometimes I think people can be scared of the media, particularly the national media, that if we engage with them, then they're going to take our story and they're going to make it something else. But we actually felt like God is, doesn't give us a spirit of fear. God gives us a spirit of strength. And um, so that's why we started Jersey Road. Um, and we've, we work with Christian organizations. Uh, we work with Christian businesses. Uh, we work with churches uh, to help them both understand what their, what their audience is, understand what their message is, and then engage with media uh, as appropriate. Um, there's a, a, a baseball player uh, in Cincinnati called Pete Rose. And he, he said, when somebody wants to interview me, I've always got something to say. Now that might sound like a, a very simple statement, but I, I think sometimes despite having the truth, this, despite having access to the truth, the church has struggled to know what to say. They've struggled sometimes to have their voice heard. And sometimes they've said something that they shouldn't have said in the media. I met with someone uh, yesterday who's involved in uh, the church in Ireland. And for those of you who are aware of the Irish context, it is complicated. And the church has actually been part of the problem to bring that complexity. But he, he was just saying that he, when he sometimes watches uh, someone who represents his church stream on television news, that he thinks that person's not saying what I think. That person's not saying my beliefs. They're not representing us. And that has definitely been a problem, that the church in the media has been represented in a way that many of us don't see in our local contexts. 
There's an a, a Australian TV show that is about to be broadcast. It hasn't been broadcast, I don't think, yet. But um, they have decided to gather, you know, like Big Brother? Uh, they've decided to gather, I think it's something like 12 Christian leaders from different backgrounds, mainly the extremes of those backgrounds, and then put them in a house together and see what happens. Now, it sounds awful. It sounds to me like here's the best way of, of positioning the church in its uh, glorious division, that there's going to be all these arguments about theology. There's, there, they've got someone who's um, uh, same-sex attracted. They've got someone who's ultra-conservative. They've got all these different groups. Now, you might say it's great that the church has been given a profile on national TV. I, I don't feel like that that's what the motivation of the producers has been in that context. So the church is almost seen as a, a laughingstock in some, in some countries. And so what I want to talk first about is, is the church still relevant? Or is the church now viewed as irrelevant and extreme? We did a study uh, in the UK uh, last year with World Vision. Barna did a study. And we wanted to find out what do the general population think about the church? And we found that 81% of the UK population either didn't think the church was good for society or couldn't think of a reason why the church was good for society. 81%. So only 19% of the UK population thought that the church was good for society. That's a pretty shocking statistic. We also uh, asked them to um, identify the characteristics that they would uh, give to the church. And there was a whole load of options we gave them and, and um, there was a, they could check any, any box, as many as they wanted. There was something like 16% who said don't know or 13%, and 13% who said none of the above. So when you put those together, even 29% of the population couldn't just put a characteristic to the church. So in the UK, this is the UK, and I am being very UK centric with this comment, but the UK church in the wider population has become, they've become apathetic. They're, they're not against the church, they just don't care. They don't care about the church anymore. Now what's interesting is that when you compare this to the US st statistics, there is a lot more feeling because the evangelical church is still a very influential presence. But th there is a difference when you talk to people about um, the church as an institution and when you talk to the, about Christians as individuals. So when you talk to, when, you, when we've in, uh, surveyed people about um, their views on Christians, they're actually quite positive. And, th and that, I think, is because one in five um, uh, people have a friend who is a Christian in the UK. And I think it, that would be similar in different contexts in Europe, that there may be an anti-institution uh, context, but actually the relationship that they have with someone who is a Christian is different. But there is definitely a move in Europe and in different parts of the world from the church being a relevant and a powerful force to being seen as otherwise. This was a, a post after the Charlie Hebdo attack from one of the cartoonists uh, of that publication. He said, friends from the whole world, thank you for your prayer for Paris, but we don't need more religion. Our faith goes to music, kisses, life, champagne, and joy. Paris is about life. I think this is probably quite indicative of the feeling about religion. 91% of Americans now say that the best place to find yourself is to look within. 91%. The best place to find yourself is to look within. But as Christians, we believe that to find yourself, you need to look outside of yourself. 
to Jesus. And so there is, there is work to be done on that. We also, um, uh, David Kinnaman, who's the president of Barna, he, uh, he wrote a book uh, recently with a guy called Gabe Lyons. And the book was called Good Faith. And actually they were um, trying to figure out whether the church was uh, still relevant or if it's now perceived to be otherwise. And they found that 61, so 60% of Americans now believe that if you try to convert someone to your religion, you're an extremist. So they would put you in the same category as Al-Qaeda or ISIS. 60%. And they actually, there was, there was a quite a, a staggeringly high, I can't remember the exact statistic, but even if you tithe to a church or you offer to pray for someone in public, many people in America saw those as acts of extremism. You know, Christian millennials as well, they, f- they feel sidelined actually in this, this current cultural moment. Almost half of them feel marginalized. 59% feel sidelined. 46% feel silenced. 47% said they were afraid to speak up. And of course, we're moving into this generation of radical connectivity. But we're also in a generation of failing secularism. Secularism has failed, and people are starting to wake up to that. I can't remember if it was this. I don't think it was in the social media thing I mentioned this, so apologies if I'm telling you the same story. But I was listening to a podcast. Uh, did I say it? Oh, anyway, I'll say it. I was listening to a podcast last week. And it, there's a comedian in the UK called Adam Buxton. And he has the Adam Buxton podcast. And I, I love it. Uh, he's not a Christian. If you're offended by bad language, do not listen to it. But he was interviewing this guy, another comedian called James Acaster. And Uh, James Acaster used to be a Christian. He used to go to church. And he was talking about his faith and the reason that he left the church. And they're both atheists now. And they were having this discussion. And at one point, uh, Adam Buxton said, it feels to me that there's so much disruption in society. There's so much chaos in society that we're due a comeback of the traditional religions. Isn't that fascinating? There's someone who's an atheist sees that when there is chaos, when there is disorder, when there is a lack of hope, that the church could still provide that place of hope. So this this being connected but having less connection is, is an issue that we're finding and a lot of research that we're doing. We're, we're currently doing a study of 15,000 millennials in 26 countries um, that's going to be launched in September. And we've, I, I think I probably did mention this the other time, but I'm going to repeat myself. Um, 31% of those 15,000 millennials say that they have someone who cares about them. 31% say they have someone who cares about them. People are twice as likely now than 10 years ago to say they feel lonely. But they are also more likely now than 10 years ago to be searching for meaning. This is a generation that is interested in being activated. They don't want a church. Does this make sense? They don't want a church that's a country club. They want a church in action. So that's my go at my philosophical approach. To, no, I've, I've covered a few things other than just post-truth. 
But I think there's a huge opportunity for the church in this moment because we have the answer. Not in an a arrogant way because we were also disconnected from God. We were also lonely. We were also hopeless. But because we found Jesus, we've found that meaning that these people are looking for. And I thought it might be good to look at Jesus as a communicator. Maybe we could say, how would Jesus engage with the media? And there's a, there are a few things that I think is worth noting. I, as I said at the start, I am not a theologian. I've just finished, uh, I don't know if you've done, uh, it's actually different to what's the, at, the, at the expo, but there's something called the Community Bible Experience, it's, it's the NIV. And they've taken all the, the chapters out and all the, the verses out, and you just read it as a book. They've, they've changed the order so that it's thematic. And it's, it's completely transformed the way I've read the Bible. But I've just finished in the, reading the New Testament. This is not me boasting, by the way, because there's been a lot of times where I've never read my Bible and I've struggled. So I hate it when people speak from the front. Do you know one of the things I hate preachers saying? When they start a sentence by saying, you know that verse in uh, Lamentations? You're like, no. I don't know that verse in Lamentations. Anyway, sorry, I'll move on. I've just finished reading the New Testament. And um, when you read the Gospels, when you look, I, I don't know about you, but whenever I, when I notice that people who have a particular profession, you tend to read the Bible through the lens of that profession a lot of the time. David Kinnaman, the president of Barna, he keeps quoting verses about why their research is biblical. <laughs> I would say the same today for PR. But Jesus, when he communicated, he actually was very focused in his communication. He tended to speak about who he was and who the kingdom of God and what the kingdom of God was. There's not a lot outside of those two things that Jesus communicated on. Now, I'm sure if you do, if you are theologians, you'll probably be able to quote a number of verses that speak differently. But it feels to me like the majority of Jesus' communication was about who he was and the kingdom of God. And I think one of the issues we've had as a church is trying to communicate on too many things. We've lost our focus in communication. And that we actually need to get back to the basics of what is compelling about the gospel message. We have a lot of debates, usually among ourselves, and quite often on social media, about the nuances of theology. And we seem to forget that people can see that. It always really disheartens me. I mean, uh, Tony was praying for someone this morning who having debates about Brexit on, on Facebook. But it really disheartens me when I see a Christian leader speaking about another Christian leader on Twitter in a negative way. I just don't, th I just don't think it's godly. So our, our, our communication has to be focused, but also it has to have impact. Jesus knew what it meant to be newsworthy. If someone casts a demon out of a man and tells that demon or those demons to go into some pigs, and then those pigs drown themselves, that's a story. Let me tell you, if that happens in Norway, or if that happens in Spain, or if it happens in whatever context you're in, tell the media about it. They will be interested. But it's interesting. Jesus said, most of the time, Jesus said to people, please don't tell anyone. I don't know if Jesus was, I don't know what his motivation was there. But every time he said, don't tell anyone, they told people. Jesus harnessed the power of word of mouth. 
That's why 5,000 men and then however many other women and children came to listen to him. They didn't mind that they were hungry. They just wanted to hear what he had to say. And why, for some reason, this doesn't get quite as much publicity, but why 4,000 just after that also, also got fed on a very little amount of food. Maybe, maybe it was a stunt. I don't think it was. But, uh, but I think he understood the power of the message. And finally, Jesus spoke with authority. But he didn't just keep that authority to himself. He gave that authority to his disciples and to us. And I think too many times as a church, we have been apologetic for our message. We have been maybe not confident. Maybe we have lacked uh, knowledge sometimes. But as a church, I think we need to regain our confidence in the authority that Jesus gave us to tell the story of his church. Because if people see what his church is doing, rather than just the child abuse and the financial misappropriation, if people see what the church is really doing, impacting lives, helping people who are lonely, alleviating poverty, taking people out of debt, helping uh, give food banks, give food to people who have nothing, give clothes to people who have nothing, visiting those in prison. If people saw that, that's something they're going to want to be a part of. So I think my simple answer to how does the church respond in a post-truth world, it's be the church. I don't have any complicated bullet points. If we just regain our confidence in what it means to be the church and we tell that story, then I think people will be attracted to it. And can I just say at this point, as Christians, I know that there are many verses in the Bible about being humble. And quite often we meet clients or potential clients and they say, yeah, but we're a Christian organization. We shouldn't really blow our own trumpet. We shouldn't shout too loudly. It's not about you. This is not about you. This is about the message. And the message is transformative. The message is what people need to hear. And if we don't tell it, then people could go to hell. And that is the, the challenge to us. Is your discomfort in telling your story more important than someone else's eternity? So, why should we even care about the media? I think simply put, the media remain. and when I say media, the word media is, is, uh, means different things to different people. And so when I'm talking about media, I'm talking about um, news media. Uh, I think there is, there is as much importance in the creative media and all these different things. We, we, I was at HTB Leadership Conference sometime in the last two weeks. I think it was last week. And uh, they featured a, an interview with David Ayello O, David Ayello O, who's, um, he was in the movie Selma. Um, and he's apparently potentially going to be the next James Bond. Um, but he and his wife uh, are both uh, actors uh, and they um, are both evangelical Christians. And what they were saying was that in Hollywood, there is this growing number of prayer groups praying for Hollywood. We often see Hollywood as the enemy, as where darkness lives. But actually, there's loads of Christians who are telling the good news, maybe subtly sometimes, maybe through movies you don't quite realize. But there's something happening. And these things, so cinema and arts and all these different things, but also news media, they still do shape how people think. So when we're talking about media, obviously we have broadcast, radio and TV. We have print, which uh, newspapers, magazines, journals. And by the way, print newspapers are probably in decline, but print in general is not. It, there, there's actually 
far more media there, than there was uh, 20 years ago. Um, and again, the Times, uh, they, they, are, they are growing. Their, their, their print uh, is growing. As a side note, um, we did a study with uh, the Bible Society uh, in the UK, in Great Britain, and uh, we found that millennials prefer print Bibles to digital Bibles. And they'd be far more likely want a print Bible. And there's something about the sacred that in the physical that you don't quite get on an app. And then obviously there's online news, bloggers, social media. And we work with uh, national media, we work with uh, regional media, local media, sector media, uh, and Christian media. And I think one point, just to, to, to the point earlier, churches, local churches, I think have a real opportunity with local media particularly. Local media love community stories. They love stories of transformation and impact at a local level. And they don't have the same prejudices. They don't seem to have the same prejudices that national media can often have. So I think if we were, one of my passions is to train churches to understand how do we identify what, what, is it, what are we doing that is a story and then how do we get that story to the local media? Because if we can flood the local media with stories, then that can transform local communities, which can transform countries. So I don't think the win is always how do we get into the biggest, the best. I think sometimes it's about being strategic and identifying where are the local stories and where are the quick wins. So um, this is where it becomes a little more dangerous with, with media in the room, but I'm, I'll, I'll go for it. Um, how do you engage with media? This is, I, I just wanted to get really practical with this. Um, it may be you already know how to do this, and I apologize if that's the case. But I think part of the reason that churches have struggled or Christian organizations have struggled to get their message to, into the media is because they don't understand how to engage with the media. And so they've just sent whatever they can in whatever format to the media and just hope that it would do something. Whereas if we can be a bit more strategic about it, then I think we can see more engagement. So the first thing I would say is do your research. Find out what is the journalist written on previously. There's no point sending a, an article about um, uh, finance to the education correspondent. Find out what that journalist has written on previously. You can do that through Google. You can do it. There's actually we use a, a program called Meltwater, which is a is a database, but it's, it can be expensive. So don't go down that route. If, if you, yeah, and if you are going down that route, make sure you negotiate. Um, they started far higher for us, and we paid thirteen thousand pounds less than what they initially wanted us to pay. So. Um, make sure you go down. <laughs> uh, so, um, so, but there, there, there's different ways of finding out what journalists have read, uh, have, have, have written on uh, before. But also research timings. When are, the re when are their deadlines? If, if you are sending, communicating with a journalist on a Wednesday and their, their deadline is Wednesday afternoon, they're not gonna read your story and they're not gonna use your story. So make sure you find out when are their deadlines and in which case then, when do I need to send it to them? And, and maybe just research, what are some of the themes that the media are picking up on? One of the things we encourage our clients to do is to newsjack. So it's not hijack, it's newsjack. And basically, if there's a story in the national press and you have some uh, thought leadership maybe into that issue, or you have some experience in that issue, you can contact the journalist and say, actually, we have um, uh, some in insight into that. Would you be interested in having a spokesperson? Or doing it um, by just kind of creating your own story around that same issue. But there's different ways of engaging with the media, but make sure you do your research. The second thing I would say is treat journalists like humans. Journalists are not aliens. Journalists are not always out 
to undermine the church. They're not always anti-Christian. In fact, there are a lot of Christians in national media working on a day-to-day basis in an incredibly difficult environment. So, I know that when I started in PR, my wife said to me, uh, as she was training me, she said, well, you have emailed them, but now you need to call them and speak to them. I was like, well, I can't speak to them. Why not? Well, they might try and trip me up. They might try and get me to say something I don't want to say. She said, they're human beings. They're created in the image of God just as you are. So treat journalists like humans. The next thing is to package the story in a way that makes it easy for the journalist to engage with. So journalists, um, we, I, I used to think journalists were lazy. That's not true. Journalists are, some, some might be, but journalists there are incredibly busy. And the budgets in media groups have been reduced significantly over the years. And so they've had to make different people redundant, which means that that same journalist, he was only looking after one, one section, now he's maybe looking after two or three, a lot of merging of departments. And so they're incredibly busy. So if you send a, f- a, a 10 paragraph uh, uh, monologue about why this, and, and the story is sort of lost in the seventh or eighth paragraph, they're gonna completely ignore it. What they need to know is, what is the story? So in your first paragraph, what is the story? Why should they care? Maybe give some details. What we tend to do is to attach a press release and then also paste the press release into the body of the email so that they don't even have to open a file. They just have to scroll down and see it. Also attach any images. Journalists need images. Every single time they are going to need an image, whether it's online, whether it's print. Obviously, if it's broadcast, that's different. But if it's, if it's online or print, they need images. And they need high-res images. Please don't send pixelated images. And if you can, try and send a relatively professional image. But they need an image. I, I would, we, we tend to put a Dropbox link rather than a, an attachment. But whatever the file size, um, feel free to do that. We also try to put the social media handle of the wh- whoever it is that's featured in the story. Basically, you need to make the, their life as easy as possible so that if they didn't even reply to you, they could run the story without needing to speak to you. Now, they might want an interview. They might want to speak to your spokesperson. Make sure you tell them who your spokesperson is. Make sure you give a bio of the spokesperson so that they know why they should interview that person. But try and give them as much information in as little words as possible. Is that helpful? I know I'm getting very practical, but um, anyway. The fourth thing is to listen. Journalists, although they are busy, sometimes will give you feedback. And they may not be able to take that story, but they may give you a bit of feedback to say, that's not going to work, but this this is why it's not going to work. Make sure you listen to that feedback and apply that next time. Because if you send the same story or a very similar story to that same journalist and you haven't listened, then they're going to completely write you off. They're not going to respond to you again. And the final thing is to develop a media list, but also update your media list. So a media list, you want to have obviously the name, uh, email, phone number, the publication. If you can find out the circulation, make sure, try and put the circulation in there as well or the the, the audience reach. Um, But our media list is our most important uh, 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 asset. And again, journalists do change jobs. They sometimes change between media. They sometimes change within the same media. But if they do change, make sure that's updated. Because again, if you're sending an article on a particular issue to the wrong journalist, that's just a waste of everyone's time. I want to give you an example. I know I gave the example, I think, of the Archbishop of Canterbury story last time I was here. I, I want to give you a, another example. We, um, and, and, and I suppose as an encouragement, I would hope that your story might still be interesting uh, to uh, 
the, the non-Christian media. Um, we, uh, we're, we work with a client called Stewardship, uh, who uh, do a lot of, um, uh, they try to help the church become more generous. They do a lot of financial services, provide financial services for churches. Um, but they also have done this campaign called 40 Acts, and it's a, a Lent campaign where they try to encourage um, not just Christians, actually, but anyone to not give anything up for Lent, but actually give out for Lent. So they want people to be generous throughout Lent. So there's for, every day you get an email or a, a notification to an app, and it tells you what the, the challenge is for that day. Uh, it might be to take someone some flowers. It might be to say something nice to your boss. It might be to send a text to someone you haven't spoken to, whatever. It, 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 there's different things throughout the week, throughout the, the period of Lent. And we sent a pitch to the Times newspaper, which, as I say, is, is it's uh, one of the most read newspapers in, in the UK, to say, um, this stewardship are trying to reinvent Lent. That sounds interesting. We're not about giving up chocolate. Would you, would you, um, would you be interested in the story? And they absolutely loved it. And they did a whole feature on 40 Acts. They ended up interviewing three different people who had done 40 Acts. Uh, and uh, they did this uh, uh, full page feature on their Saturday edition that, um, that reached, you know, I can't remember, something millions of people. Now, we've also seen the other side where um, there's a, a magazine called Stylist, which is one of those magazines that's given out at train stations. Um, and uh, for free. And uh, Stylist, we actually pitched to them this year. So that Times article was last year. The Stylist, we pitched this year that one of their journalists actually did the challenge. We wanted them to do it and then document it. And they said yes. And we didn't say this is a Christian thing. We just said, you know, it's about generosity. It's about Lent. We just assumed Lent. They would know. And, uh, and they, were, they, were all, they were all sold in. And then the day before... They said, we're going to have to pull out. And I think it's because they, they felt it was too Christian. Now, so we, we have, I'm, I'm giving some good news stories, but I also want you to see that there are knockbacks as well. And that this is just part of the journey. That sometimes you'll get good response and sometimes you won't. Now, Christian media are amazing. Because they're not, um, they're full of, really capable journalists. They're, these are not people who kind of think they can write, but actually they couldn't get a job in the, t in the, in the national press, so they've decided to just do Christian press. This is not what it's about. They're capable journalists who work to the... Well, I'm glad I said the right thing. Man, I could have gone the other way, and that could have been a problem. So, those, but those journalists, um, you, you don't want to treat them differently just because they're Christians. So make sure that those principles that I, I've said you're using for them as much as you are, because it's not just, oh, we're brothers in Christ or sisters in Christ, therefore you will run my story. If you don't have a story, you don't have a story. So make sure that it's still a story. But can I also just um, advocate for the denominational media as well? Because I, we are big champions of denominational media that um, for our clients, we say, you know, whilst the denominational media, they may have lower circulation. It's the leaders of the denominations that are often leading, uh, reading those, those media. And therefore, you're influencing the, the influencers. So don't discount them just because of their circulation numbers. All right, I'm going to get you to do a practical in a minute because I know I've just been talking at you and I, I'm, I'm mildly apologetic for that. Um, one of the things that we talk to all of our clients about before we do a press release, before we do a feature pitch, before we do anything, is to get them to understand what are your key messages? What is it you're trying to say? And I think, again, as a church, we've not really understood what our key messages are. I think we've said a lot of things. I think we've had a lot of opinions on a lot of different things. But I think we have verged away from what our key messages are. Our key messages, they should be believable, they should be concise, they should be compelling, they should make people care. 
but when we're doing media training, when we're preparing someone to speak to radio or when we're preparing someone to speak to TV, we say, make sure you have three key messages and one story and stick to those. It could be you say a message in a different way four or five times. I don't know what it's like for you guys in your context, but our politicians are, are masters of this, where it doesn't matter what the question is, they'll answer it, they'll give the answer that they want to give. Now that's, I'd say that's a little lacking authenticity. So I wouldn't go down that route. However, what I would say is, don't feel you have to answer the question. Now, if I'm in a room of journalists here, this is probably not the right audience. But if I'm in a room of journalists, you don't have to answer the question if you don't feel you have an answer for it. I think one of the problems that the church spokespeople have had is that they've tried to answer questions that they don't know the answer to. And they've tried to do it in a public square. So if you don't have the answer, either say you don't have the answer and admit we don't have the answer, or use the t bridging technique, which we try to uh, encourage a lot of our guys to do, which is, I think that speaks to the wider issue of, and then insert your key message. There's three things that we say um, to any client. The three C's are be clear. Now, you might think you're being clear, but you can usually tell by the facial expression or the lack of an email back whether or not you've been clear. But clarity actually, I think, is, a, is an issue in, in communicating faith, issues of faith because people don't get it. We're moving, well, in the UK, I think, and this is just my opinion, we're moving from a post-Christian country to a pre-Christian country where the generation uh, that are now having kids and, and those kids are growing up, the, that generation have never been to church and their kids have never been to church. So I think that's a massive opportunity because these people have never been hurt by church. They've never been taught bad theology. We only need to point them to the person of Jesus and that's gonna be compelling. But we have to be clear to those people because they have no spiritual context. They have, we, we need to be clear in the words we use. When I was leading the church, we would have the, the Bible verse on the screen and the, say Matthew 25 verse one, I would say, so that first word is the name of the book. The number 25 is the chapter number, and the number after the colon is the verse number. Because if you're not a Christian, and you're living in a pre-Christian context, you've no, what, is that, what, is, what is that? It's just nonsense. So we need to understand who our audience is and what they understand, and also not using acronyms. Avoid acronyms, avoid jargon. We speak in Christianese a lot of the time. And the world out there doesn't understand it. Obviously, it depends on the story and what you're trying to do. Because if you are speaking to a Christian audience or you're speaking to a, a, a group of theologians, then you need, need, need to change your language because they understand more than, more than uh, the others would. The second thing is to be compelling. That's what I was saying earlier about Jesus. He was always newsworthy. And, and both being clear and compelling, you can actually test these with people. You can, you can see whether or not people actually are engaging with the story. Is this interesting? There's a lot, of, a lot of what we do actually isn't that interesting. And it's certainly not newsworthy. So let's not try and force things on the media that are actually not very interesting. Let's give them the things that are interesting that are gonna be newsworthy and try and stick to those because actually you do lose credibility with the media if you send them stories that are, that are absolutely useless, that are not newsworthy. I've had that example this week where we've, that one of our clients has launched a new report and a journalist came back to me and said, well, that's exactly what I thought was the case. That report is not telling me anything new. And so I've gone back to them saying, well, yeah, I mean, that's, that's, that's a very good point. Um, but mate, you might want an interview with the person who's, put, who's done it because of their story, and then I've kind of gone down a different route because I actually agree with them that I think the, the report's not very interesting. Oh, this has been recorded, okay. Um, and this, the, the last thing is being consistent. Um, uh, consistency is, is, is one of the major issues in terms of how we communicate. And I think this is partly a problem because there's so many different streams of church that are communicating so many different things.
But people outside the church don't see those different streams. They see the church and they hear hundreds of different opinions from that church that are almost always contradicting each other. Jesus in his prayer for uh, the church prayed for one thing, unity. We need unity in the body of Christ, but we also need unity in the message. We don't need uniformity, we just need unity. The author and journalist Neil Strauss, he said, I know that I need honesty from people I interview. I also know that truth is more interesting than made up stuff. And also people don't connect with you if you're not honest. There's some research to show that even if, and this is with millennials, even if you millennials disagree with your views on sexuality or gender, that if you are clear about what you say and you're honest, they may stay in your church because they appreciate you being transparent and authentic. How does that work into the rest of our communications? I have 10 minutes, right? So I'm about to give you the big reveal about how do we communicate with media in a post-truth world? What is the golden ticket? And it's not as surprising as you might think. Stories. If we try and go to the media, particularly the national media, the secular media, with theological debate, they could argue with us for, for years to come. If we go to them with stories, you can't argue with a story. It's someone's life experience. It's something that's transformed them. You know, I mentioned the social media post that we posted when we became pregnant or when we had our, our daughter. It was the non-Christians who were so supportive and thankful and even saying some Christian-y words in their comments. Jesus told stories all the time. The Bible is full of stories. And interestingly, the media wants stories. This was a conference I was at a couple of weeks ago. Sophia smith Galler works for the BBC Worldwide. She said, the best stories are always case studies. Very rarely this year have I interviewed an expert. I thought that was fascinating. Now, that's not right for everyone. There are media who do want an expert opinion in different things. But we are finding a lot more traction when we're not just offering a feature piece or a news story, but we're actually saying, here's a case study. Here's a story of someone. Recently, we, we worked with um, Christians Against Poverty in Australia. And we, we framed it in that there's a debt crisis in Australia. And would, would anyone be interested in interviewing these two people who have been impacted by the work of Christians Against Poverty? Is Christians Against Poverty in Europe as well? No. Should I explain what they, what they do? So they basically help people out of debt. So they're a Christian organization who help people out of debt. In the UK, they've got huge profile because this, there's a guy called Martin Lewis who's a, who's a national uh, known by everyone as the money-saving expert. He is not a Christian, and he has been a big advocate for Christians Against Poverty. But we did this uh, pitch uh, a couple of weeks ago and said, Here, here's the frame, here's the case studies. And we've had uh, news.com.au, uh, who are the, the main Australian news site, and ABC, who are the, the, the main Australian broadcaster, both interview those case studies because they're interesting stories. All of us have stories. So if we can, try and gather those stories and engage media with those stories. In a post-truth world, stories give us an opportunity to engage in a dialogue rather than a debate. People are less defensive when you share stories. Actually, Jesus rarely debated theology with anyone other than the Pharisees. Otherwise, he just told stories. 